सहनावतु सहनो हुनक्तु सहवीर्यम करवावई तेजस्विनावदी तमस्तु मावित्विशावई ओम शांति 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 so we charge chandra day and today we move on to question number 4 and it says question is how does one achieve moksha moksha is attained through brahm jnana now moksha mokshaya two words in Sanskrit, moh is attachment, kshaya means destruction. So moksha means destruction of attachment. But usually in public opinions, and this is what everybody believes in, wishes to believe in, and that's not having a rebirth is moksha. Never being born again is moksha. But from Vedantic perspective, it's absolutely wrong. In Vedantic perspective, moksha means the destruction of attachment. And say, if the destruction of attachment has happened, then even when the body is very much alive, kicking, breathing, pulsating, and if you have no attachment with the body, and you know what your true self is. You are already mukta. Mukta means one who has attained the moksha. If you are attached with the body, because the attachment begins from this body, that this is me, this is mine, and then this attachment when flows to people who are around me, then this becomes the ties, the word is asakti. Asakti means now when where you are now tied with that person. Now how did this tying with say family, uh, your friends, your house, your toys, your children, your wealth, your relations, bring everybody in that. Why do we have ties with them? Question. Out of the context now. Why do we have ties with them? Even when sometimes people are bad, but still because of our relation with them, we find it very difficult to live without them. Hence, people are in very abusive relationships and yet they endure that. Why? So here comes the answer. Because... When you have attachment with the body, this very attachment will flow to the near and dear ones. Hence, you get tied to them. Why? Because you are tied with your own body. Now, usually we want to break our ties with people. Oh, I'll stay away from them. I'll not have anything to do with them. I will not see them. Like the renunciates, they just run away and live in caves and live in jungles and live by the rivers and they cut themselves off from all the family ties. And they think now we'll be free of them, but no it. World is not outside, world is in your mind. So, so if this woman is my wife, this is my mom, that's my sister, that's my daughter, is this in your mind or is it that those people are carrying some label on their heads which say that they are your so and so it's that your parents said this is your sister that's your brother and you say okay now you are my siblings and then you had a, a, a tie with them but say after 30 40 years you come to know that this this sister or this brother was adopted so they are not your biological sister or brother. Then sometimes person says, oh no, it's the emotional ties which is making this person my sister or brother. 
So is it the emotion which brings the relationship or is it just the blood which makes you in relationship with that person? I am reminded of a person, a young boy in, his, in America, to make extra money, he would do sperm donation. And in span of almost 10 years or so, he did so many. And then those sperms went on to uh, those people who wanted to have a child, the, the infertility clinics. So by record, by law, they are supposed to hide the identity of uh, the man. But in one case, the, the girl wanted to know from where have I come. So she somehow went through court, got some orders, and then that file was opened up, and then she traced this man. And then some investigative journalist took the job, and then he opened up all the files in all the 10 years, and it turned out to be he had fathered almost 100 children, and he has no clue. But does he feel as a father to any of them? Why? There is no understanding, there is no um, sense of being with that person, the proximity is not there, the closeness is missing. So when this person actually happened to meet, uh, I don't recall the name of the anchor of one of the show, the talk show, where almost 20 of those kids were brought and this man was there. And one after another, they were kind of brought and he could see, okay, even all these faces. Because the women were different, hence the looks were different. So almost 100 kids. Now he doesn't have any attachment to all these kids. But he actually felt very guilty about doing this sperm donation. Because... It's very, very inhumane, he felt, that I am reason that they are on this earth, and yet they have no clingingness to him, and he has no responsibility for them. And yet he felt guilty, but also he felt happy that those women, the mothers, were thanking that because of the donation, we could become a mother. So it was a very complicated situation. So I bring this to the point that when you have attachment with your body, you will have attachment to people associated with this body. Now, you don't want to have any attachment with anybody, then what should you do? Then you will have to break the attachment with this body first. As long as in Sanskrit we say, Aham dehe, meaning I am body, and mam dehe, and this body is mine. Now, nobody says, I am a hand, but yet when anything is done by these hands, we take claim of that. Nobody says, I am a foot, but when this foot hurts, then you say, my foot is hurting. See, it's, it's very tricky. You never say, I am eyes. But when you can't see, like if somebody goes blind, then that person says, I am blind. But when the eyes were fine, nobody says, I am eyes, I am ears, I am nose, I am tongue. It seems like I am using it, but yet because of agyanata, not knowing, we feel this body is me, I. So when we have the attachment towards this body, it moves on to others. There's aham and there's mum. Mum means mine and aham is, this is me, body, mind and senses. And this creates a bondage. Whatever is done by the body, the self is claiming I have done it. Good deeds, bad deeds. Ethical, unethical, moral, immoral, religious, irreligious acts done by this body, by this mind, are considered to be as I have done it. That's how the not, not 
is created in between the body mind and me and that's the bondage and when this bondage is is cut then this is the liberation or the moksha mm. okay next question is fourth how does one achieve moksha answer moksha is attained through brahma jnana very simple moksha is attained through brahma jnana brahma means the absolute existence jnana means knowledge so how will one attain the moksha by knowing what that absolute truth is now our body is not absolute truth it's a very mortal transient existence mind is a very changeable um very uh flowy very temperamental very illusionary have you ever seen your mind and yet everybody says mind your mind mind your business what does that mean all the business done by mind should be concern of that i which owns that mind should we say own this mind or just use this mind do you own your mind <laughs> have you seen your mind can you feel your mind can you touch your mind can you hear your mind and yet your all business is happening through the mind so mind is a pretty illusory entity but yet this mind is the window through which you have connection with the external world and even with yourself so what is eternal and what is not what is transient and what is permanent what is truth and what is untruth what is real what is unreal the brahma gyan meaning it is the knowledge of that when we say brahma the word brahma means great the word brahma comes from the word brahat and brahat means big huge large vast so brahma bra atman brahman the great atman is brahman in hindi we call it brahm not brahma brahma is the creator but we say brahm but many people like to pronounce it brahman maybe that's right maybe not but i choose to speak brahm the way we do it in sanskrit so i won't change it in english also so i'll still say it brahm maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm not but that's what i love so that's what i'll say so knowledge of brahm is which will give you a uh, moksha moksha is definitely not going to some loka loka means plane of the deities like shiva and vishnu and rama and sri krishna they have believed to be uh, to be uh, living in those lokas and from there they transport their mirror vision reflection onto this earth which we call the avatara so as per the puranas the the krishna doesn't comes but krishna sends his mirror image who is like a human being and who lives like a human being interacts like a human being so in the puranas the krishna rama and vishnu they never come in the form of a human but they send their reflection now this is what the we call the philosophies of the dualism dwait dual dualism dwait vad vad means philosophy so the dwait vad or the philosophy of the dualism says that these vishnu shiva live in their lokas planes and somebody who does worship of these these uh, uh, deities will one day achieve entry into the planes or the house or the loka of that deity 
So Shiva Loka, Vishnu Loka, in, in all these various. Durga has a Loka, you know, and so on. But the Vedanta has a very different take on to it. Uh, now this, Sanatan Dharma believes in pluralism. Sanatan Dharma doesn't believe into monotheism. Monotheism is there is only one God. Islam, Christianity, Jews, one God. But pluralism means God has become everyone and everything. Hence every form is God. So you cannot just pinpoint, oh, this is God and this is not. So God can be in form and God can be without a form too. The monotheistic Islam, Christianity, say that God will never be born as a, a human being. But in Sanatan Dharma, we say, number one, God is not an entity which is somewhere far above and is controlling and creating and is very busy guy. But we say, God has become the creation. So even a glade of a grass is God. So even a stone is God. Remember you, when I am saying God, it's not God, God, it's the Brahman. Brahman has become everything. Brahm is everything. Hence, you can worship a tree, a stone, a river, a mountain, a hill, an ocean, anything. Because, end of the day, it is Brahm. So, we have no issue. You know, this is one question which many people ask that why Hindus have so many gods? No, 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 no. We don't have so many gods. We say everybody is God. Even the stupid questioner is a God. <laughs> Even that person who is asking this question, who doesn't understand, who is ignoramus, is also a Brahman. So when everything is Brahman, hence anything can be in the beginning, when you don't know what the reality or the truth is, you can begin your journey by sitting by a stone or a river or a hill or a tree or a tulsi plant or a people or a bird riksha and, and uh, say the mantras and bow down and until you realize that you too are Brahman. So major religions are either monotheistic and the Sanatan Dharma, the Hindu Dharma is very pluralistic. But in the root, the truth is that the Brahman and only Brahman is existent and rest is just the illusionary forms which get created, formed and which will go away. Like everything is, every ornament is made out of gold. So gold is in every ornament and yet gold is not an ornament. You can melt all the ornaments in a cauldron and they will all turn into liquid gold. And then you can change a bangle into earring, an earring into an anklet, an anklet into a neck piece, a neck piece into a head piece, a head piece into a ring, a ring into whatever. So gold is present in every ornament and yet gold is not an ornament. Similarly, Brahmana is everything and yet Brahmana is not everything. This is this little you know, you'll have to use all your brains to understand what I'm saying. So it's not that easy, but it's not that difficult also, because that's what the reality is. So how does one achieve moksha? And that is by Brahma Gyan. Now, Brahma Gyan. Gyan, as I said earlier also, Gyan or the wisdom is, is another name of Brahman. And that is eternal. And that is what our rishis could find. And that's how they, they uh, spoke in their words and, and explained it to everybody, those who came to them. They were not lecturing like me going to city to city. No, no, no. They would just sit in their own place. Whosoever would come to them the way now I intend to do. That is not go here and there and just sit here and whosoever comes, learn. 
And if you don't come, okay, I'm fine with that. Because then you'll be burning in your own agyana, in your own darkness. So the rishis gave this through their compassion, this knowledge to the, to the seekers. And in time, the seekers then stored it in their memories. And then after many, many years, they brought it out on, a, on you know, whatever material was available, whether bark of a tree or a, uh, a leather or a wall of a cave. So they wrote it down. But basically, the tradition is, which we say, that is that you hear and then you remember. When you hear Shravani, that is the Shrut, what you hear. And then what you remember is a Smurti. So Vedic knowledge has traveled this vast time through the Shruti and Smurti. So Guru would speak and disciples would hear and then they would remember. Now, point is, why don't you remember everything what I speak? Problem is, the container in which this knowledge is going, that container is not clean, not pure, not um, actually ready for it. A mind which has too much of filth cannot retain this knowledge. They will surely leak it. When you have a hole in a utensil and you pour anything into it, it's just going to leak. So a mind which is impure, a mind which is filled with holes of ego and greed and lust and jealousy and incompetence and lack of concentration and too many desires, desire to be big, desire to be popular. Many become sadhu just because, oh, they think, now, for example, if anybody comes in this ashram, they haven't seen me when I was traveling alone with one small suitcase and a bag on my shoulder, which had all my books, few of my Vedanta books, one blanket, three set of clothes. That's it. One sheet to lay down on any place so that I can adjust. The sheet would be a little thicker where, where I don't need a, an underneath mattress or something. And I've traveled so many years with this much. That was my total ownership. Maybe three or four or six or one thousand rupees at the max in my purse. And I would just move wherever I felt like going. And remember, nobody would give me a room because I was young. Just 22 years old. And they doubted me. Who are you? Do you have permission? Did you run away from your home? Who is your guru? How did your guru permit you to go like that? Nobody trusted. Nobody gave a place. Every three, third day, fifth day, maybe seven day, they would ask, what's your next plan? And move on. So all those people today who have not seen me in the way I was, like a true sadhu, no belonging, no ownership, no property, no bank account, nothing. And today if they see me, I have this huge ashram and institute and the buildings and the halls and the trust which is running it. So there are many who would get very interested to join me today. Because they might think that that's the easy way to have all the luxuries and conveniences and respect of society. Because if you are my disciple today, surely there is a big section of society who will worship you equally because you are my disciple, thinking you two are a Brahmagyani, an Atmagyani. And that seems to be a golden ticket for many. So, is this person who is coming to me today with the dire need and fire to know the true self? Or is it finding an escape route that they don't have to work and they'll get all the things, you know, all the things available? Right? And in this world, how many are there who are actually feeling pain that they are in a bondage? That they have to remove this agyana, the darkness. 
because their bondages are not hurting them, hence they don't want any liberation. And many today come here just to take my blessings, just to have darshan and go back home happy. And they say, bless us Guruji, we are getting married, I'm opening shop, I'm buying a new house, I'm getting a new car. And please bless us that, so that you know, we get insured and protected with your blessings and nothing goes wrong. Have they understood me? that everything is transient and it won't remain every day. Every day is not same. Things will go up and down. Who is born will be dying. Today you have success, tomorrow you might not. Today you have properties, tomorrow might not. See, now you think, oh, I own two flats in so-and-so area. Oh, that much money I have. And one earthquake comes and the whole building collapses and your property is gone. Right? See, in this corona time, this is what's happening. Somebody is getting sick, he, uh, he or she had a compromised health, um, asthma or lung issue or pneumonia, and now they are getting com complications and they are the ones who are dying. And the family is not being even called that your person has died. And when the family wants to um, get the claim onto the death body, they say, well, there is a heap of dead bodies we have no time to sort out it's a very very uh, i would say heart-wrenching times it's a very heart-wrenching times but seeing this naked dance of death how many would have the urge to know what is beyond the death what is the way to be saved from all this shitty environment? You know, fear and scare is eating out people at the moment. Just today I read about uh, a doctor who committed suicide, a patient who jumped from fourth floor, a IRS officer, a tax officer committing suicide after killing his wife fearing that they might get corona and he was negative in the post-mortem there was no corona but just the fear that i might die people are committing suicide but how many people will learn and would like to come out of this fear and understand why we have this fear and understand what's the factual and phenomenal jnana which is available to us because we, I would, I would say we are so, so fortunate, we are so fortunate that we have the great Vedic knowledge with us, which we can use to eradicate our fears and burdens and bondages and, and be truly liberated while being alive. Our, our liberation is not dependent that we die first, you know. Because there are religions which say that when you will die, then you will go to Jannat. The first condition to go to the Jannat is that you have to die. Well, what about now? I am suffering so much. Also, oh, just believe. But when we say moksha, and the moksha is directly related to Brahma Jnana. So Vedanta doesn't talk about imaginary hells and heavens. Those who went there never SMSed us from there. No WhatsApp, no message coming from there. And who are alive, they just have an imagination about it, that there is a hell and that there, there is a Jannat, there is a heaven. Well, Hindus have their own heaven and Sikhs also and Buddhists also and Jainas also. And mind you, they are all very different. For example, the Tibetan heaven has a beautiful summer in it. But the heaven of Hindus has cool air blowing. Why this difference of uh, temperature? Because Tibet is a cold place. What is heavenly for them? A summer. And in this scorching heat in month of June, what would you like? Cool air. So they are using their imaginations and they, they have created this imaginative world and in many heavens, 
like heaven of Muslims and heaven of Christians. There are there is a river of um, liquor flowing. It's not poured from a pitcher, but it's a river. You can not only drink, you can bathe in it, swim in it. Right? <clears throat> what does a man want? End of the day, it's just a woman's body. So what does their heaven have? They have 72 whores who are waiting to have, a, you know, you know it what. And so they are fantasizing about all those women. Right? And the, there's abundance of food and they have trees which are laden with fruit and there are, you know, all the modes of entertainment have been kept. Even in the Hindus' heaven, they have Menka and Ramba, the beautiful dancers who can, who can dance for eternity and who will never be plus 16 years old. They always remain 16. They're always girlish, always, you know, never diminishing youth is there because they have drunk the Amrit, hence they will never become old, right? So these are all ideas created by the imagination of a mind which has very earthly desires. But in Vedanta, we do not advocate or believe into a fictitious imaginative world but we say that the, the, the Brahma Gyan can give you what, that's what the next question is, fifth question. What does Brahma Gyana mean? Knowing Brahma as it is, absolute omniscient existence is Brahma Gyan. What is Brahma Gyan? Knowing what Brahma is called Brahma Gyan. And Brahman is what? See, the absolute one, two, omniscient existence. So Vedanta doesn't say Brahman is a he or a she. Because we are not talking about a body or forms. And if we talk about bodies, then we'll have to agree that that body was born from a mother and from a father. And they died and then one day this this absolute will also die then, this God will also die then. Like often you know, children say, who is daddy of God? And they say, there's no daddy of God. I say, when I have a daddy, why don't God, why, why can't God also? God cannot be born without a daddy or a mommy. So who is mommy of God? Nobody. Or no, I don't believe, then there is no God. Because the child knows this much. And mind you, most of the people, are still in their heads that child. So who created God is a very, very popular question. Who created God? When we say nobody, then they can't understand that without any cause, there can't be any effect. Karana, Karya. Who is Karana? Who is the cause of God? And if you say nobody, they say no, no, no. That is a very unscientific answer. So what is Brahma Jnana, knowing the Brahma as it is. See, now people have the idea about God as per the scriptures and as per what is written in that scripture. They have no direct experience of that. Hence, the variety of religions have a variety of definition of God. In itself, like Hinduism, Devi, Hanuman, Shiva, Vishnu, Rama, Krishna, Durga, Kali, so many forms of, of God. And, and in Christianity and Judaism and Jews, they have a God which is without a form, monotheistic. There's one God and there's no form. Uh, <clears throat> now, I raise one question. In Sanskrit, we say Nira Akara. Nira without akara form. So the many say God is nirakara, God is without a form. Now my question is, if God is nirakara, then how did you come to know that this is God? We identify anything either by the name and for that name there has to be a form. 
If there is no form, there is no name. So Nama Rupa, Sanskrit. Rupa, form, Nama, name. Nama, when got deviated, contorted and twisted, became name in English. Nama, Nama, same. So Nama is a root word. When you say God is formless, then the question arises, how did you identify that this is God? See, even we can't see air, but we feel it on the skin. So one sense of touch is, which is giving us understanding that, oh, yeah, air is blowing. Or we see a tree moving, leaves fluttering. Okay, the wind is blowing. And if the leaves are not fluttering, we say that there is no wind today. There is no wind today or there is no air today? Actually, there is no wind. But you can't say there is no air. But how do you feel air? When you breathe in and when you feel the temperature or the thrust of that wind wift, waft which came to you. So when you say God is formless, nirakara, how did you know that this is God? And if there is no way to know God, then how do you believe that there is something called Nirakara? It isn't just a make-belief than imagination. See, there are only two ways to experience anything. One is Idama, another is Ahama. Aham is self and Idama is the other. Right? For anything which is other than me, that thing has to have a name and a form. Right? For example, this phone has a name and a form. This remote has a name and a form. This box has a name and a form. Your body has a name and a form. Your Guruma's body has a name and a form. Idama, this is other. Ahama, Ahama is self. Now how do you know that you are? Now you will say, I know it. If I say, how? Is there any way that you can explain me how you know that you are existing? You will say, I know it. But there is no way to explain how you experience this I. Now, ahama is experienced without the senses. But ahama and idama's difference is for experience the idam, you need senses, but to experience the aham, you don't need senses. Two ways only to experience anything. So the whole universe is idama and is experienced by ahama, me. Right? Now my question is, is this nirakara idama or ahama? <laughs> if it is an idama, then has a name and form. And if it has name and form, then it is not Nirakara. And if you say it is in the self, right? If it is, you say it is in the self, then this would be a very righteous statement of our philosophy that this Ahama is Brahmana. So there is no room for this word nirakara. Actually, people just use it and repeat it. Nirakara, nirakara, God is nirakara. And Vedanta never says believe. This is a Vedantic scripture. It will never say believe. It will always say no. Not N-O, but K-N-O-W, which somebody was saying Kano. Kano. Now why K is silent? In Sanskrit, even if the alphabet is half, the uh, half a swara, we speak that. We don't leave it. But English is a funny language. So you write K-N-O-W, but still you say no. But they, they have no also as N-O-N-O. -no. So Kano should be better. No is not correct. But anyhow, so Nirakara, is not a very appropriate word. So when we say Brahmana, then it is that existent which is omniscient and which is eternal.